So, but now we're going to uh, switch gears and talk about the Estonians. Um, so, the topic of the, the the purpose of the entire today's event is to discuss the treatments, the uh, mostly new treatments and treatments that are in development. So we could have a separate event uh, discussing the diseases itself. It's more educational, but I want to get to the actually to the bottom line, explain to you what's out there that can help you. And uh, we won't be covering as much basic science as I uh, would usually do, because we can't accomplish everything in three hours, clearly. So dystonias. Well, dystonias are sustained muscle contractions that result in movement of a joint or head or arm. So it's basically a fight between opposing muscles let's say your biceps and, and triceps, so uh, one is trying to bring your, uh, or flex your elbow, the other one is trying to extend your elbow, and uh, at the result, you have kind of spasm in the muscles. And uh, <clears throat> that is, we don't know exactly why dystonias occur. We believe that some of them are genetic. Some of them could be due to stroke or, or another uh, brain lesion. Some of them, and most of them, frankly, occur for, re occur for reasons we never know. So um, the localization is important because uh, the dystonias can be categorized into focal dystonias. They only affect, let's say, your hand. They could be multifocal. They can affect your hand and your elbow. They can be uh, affecting just the face or only the neck, like cervical dystonia. They also can be affecting um, limbs, like people have task-specific dystonia, like the writer's cramp. You might have heard of writer's cramp, and that's the example of task-specific dystonia where strong, someone is trying to write and their hand turns into a pretzel like that. Uh, the segmental dystonia affect one segment of the body, let's say the entire arm and the shoulder. There could be hemidystonia affecting half of the body, or there could be generalized dystonia. And uh, the most of the dystonias are idiopathic, meaning we have no idea why it occurs. There could be drug-related dystonias like antipsychotics and uh, antiemetics, meaning the anti-nausea medications, they can cause dystonia as well. There could be genetic like DYT1, that's the gene that was identified in um, um, genetic dystonias and that usually occurs in um, Ashkenazi Jewish population actually in kids, young kids, where they twist it like a pretzel and they're, they're in a wheelchair essentially. And uh, the pills only help so much and that's when deep brain stimulation surgery was developed for those folks and uh, the results are amazing. I mean, they just, uh, it takes a while, it takes a few years, but they're walking like absolutely normal people after being, um, you know, wheelchair bound. So uh, that's the only, um, for generalized dystonia, I would say this is the way to go in terms of deep brain stimulation therapy. Now, there's some psychogenic dystonias. People have some um, psychological stress and that results in abnormal movements. Structural. So I already uh, mentioned about the stroke or any other uh, lesions, let's say uh, uh, trauma to the brain that can cause injury to that motor circuitry that will result in abnormal posturing of uh, the arm or leg and some uh, rare disorders can cause that as well. So how do we manage that? Well, we need to really treat underlying disorder, find out uh, uh, is there anything that's causing it? Is there a lesion? If not, then um, is, there, is it a part of a big neurological uh, disorder that uh, uh, we need to understand? Because sometimes dystonia can occur in Parkinson's disease. In fact, younger people uh, tend to have dystonia more than the tremor. So they, the disease, Parkinson's disease, can start in a younger person as a twisting of the ankle inwards, and that kind of they'll be limping a little bit. Looks like pure dystonia. But this is just the beginning of Parkinson's. So you really need to understand uh, uh, whether dystonia is a standalone dystonia or part of bigger picture. And uh, uh, there are medical treatments, of course, used for dystonia, such as trihexafenidine, which is Artane, Valium, Baclofen, Clonazepam. But, and they do help, but they're not that great. So the reason why they're not that great because of the potential side effects, meaning I cannot achieve the or, or reach the needed dose for the patient because the dose is uh, limited by the side effects. So I have to stop before people really uh, notice significant improvement. They notice some improvement, but then they develop side effects, and it's always become a battle between what's you know more important, the, the, the side effect or the benefit. So therefore, medications have limited value. 
And sometimes we use all of the four classes, uh, which I listed here. Um, here, uh, arcane value and baclofen and clonazepam. Now, botulinum toxin was developed probably in the late 80s, and uh, it's approved. We're going to talk about that separately. And uh, <clears throat> botulinum toxin is basically toxin that uh, prevents uh, um, release of the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft and prevents muscle from uh, contracting. So it basically weakens your muscles. But if injected in the hyperactive muscle, it certainly can give you um, enough release of the muscle or, or relaxation without any side effects because it doesn't get to your bloodstream, it doesn't get to your brain. So there are no side effects beyond the area where the injection took place. And that's why it's so um, useful for many things we'll discuss later on. But um, the, right now, it's the focal dystonia I want to mention. So for cervical dystonia, for rider's cramp, um, it can be used. Now, for severe medication or fracture, generalized dystonia, as I already alluded to, uh, deep brain stimulation seems to be working um, uh, quite well. And that was approved by the FDA in the 1997, I think. Uh, and I've had several patients who had it as kids, frankly, like uh, t uh, young teenagers. And uh, by the, like in a matter of few years, they were, they were completely fine. So unlike um, tremor, dystonia doesn't get better immediately after deep brain stimulation surgery. So let's say for tremor, they put it in and uh, you get off the table, you wake up from the surgery and you have no tremor. Come, immediate response, immediate. For dystonia, it might take up to six months or nine months to actually uh, notice significant improvement. So, uh, but it, uh, the, the symptoms do improve. And the, what's the... <coughs> usual kind of uh, algorithm for treatment of dystonia. Well, that consists of the three um, domains, as I mentioned. So the surgery, the brain stimulation surgery, or chemodegeneration, it means the uh, botulinum toxin injections. And there are two types, the ty toxin type A and uh, toxin type B. Pardon my uh, use of the brand name. So uh, there, there are several toxins, not just Botox, uh, but there's only one um, uh, toxin B, which is approved in the United States, it's called myoblock. So there are two types, A and B, but that's the botulinum toxin, and there are oral medications, and I listed them. Uh, so we, of course, start with, if it's a focal dystonia, I wouldn't even play around with the medications. I would go directly to the botulinum toxin. Uh, if uh, and I might add some medications if it's more than just focal dystonia. Is if dystonia is uh, uh, quite severe and generalized, uh, I would go directly to uh, the surgery. In which case, we can spare you from side effects of all these medications. And uh, uh, you know, we we can't inject gallon of bot botulinum toxin, so therefore, surgery would be the alternative to that. So, um, I already mentioned that there are two types, and uh, there are three uh, of uh, serotype A and B of botulinum toxin, and A has uh, three approved drugs on the market, Botox, Xeamine, and G-Sport, and uh, serotype B is Myoblock. So, how do I choose between those? So, um, I personally never use G-Sport. Not that I have anything against it, I just personally never, never did. So, it's apparently as good as others, but I, I, I never got to use it. So, I'm using uh, uh, Botox or Xeamine. That's uh, uh, type A. Type B, my block. Uh, I use it for drooling. And uh, the reason why is because it works best for drooling. Uh, based on our experience, it's not approved, I think, yet for drooling. But again, this is, uh, this is not a, uh, the, the, the talk is, is not really limiting me in terms of what I can tell you. So I don't have to be on label. And uh, I, I'm telling you what, what uh, you know, doctors are using in movement disorders um, and what's the best treatment based on our experience. And uh, so my, my block, um, does uh, uh, it, it has acidic environment. So when injected, you can have uh, more pain than with uh, Botox or Xeamine. So um, it can be used for cervical dystonia as well, but it just hurts more. So I don't use it for that purpose. But for the drooling, it works the best. Now, um, and we'll talk about new uh, things that, uh, in development a little bit later, but let me just uh, cover, cover other, a couple of other things. So, blepharospasms, it's a variant of dystonia when people have involuntary spasms of the eyes, uh, eye muscles, so basically they close the eyes and they have difficulty keeping the eyes uh, open. And um, it's just another, it's a facial dystonia. So, the treatment for that is botulinum toxin injection uh, in the muscles around the eye area. And I'll show you a picture next slide. 
But it certainly can limit people's uh, quality of life because they, they might not be able to watch TV or talk to other people. When they're talking, they close their eyes involuntarily. Uh, and uh, botulinum toxin does help. And it's injected around the um, eye. So that's called orbicularis oculi muscle. I usually do five shots. And the effect lasts uh, three months approximately. Um, the maximum effect usually is achieved one month after the injection. Uh, potential side effects of that, well, botulinum toxin weakens your muscles. So if I inject too much, people might have difficulty opening the eyes. Um, no, sorry, um, I meant to say uh, closing the eyes, not the opening. So they, they, they might not be able to, to shut the eyes uh, tight because you know, that, that's what Botox does. It weakens that muscle for hyperreactive muscles that causing uh, too much closure of the eye. So uh, I'm just relaxing those muscles with these injections. So um, uh, now hemifacial spasm, it's another uh, uh, dystonic um, symptom which results in uh, involuntary um, kind of spasm on one side of the face. A uh, most common cause for that is uh, Bell's palsy, is a sequela of Bell's palsy. So when you have drooping of the face, you might have seen some of your friends or whoever might have had it. And after that, the, the nerve regenerates, but unfortunately, as it regenerates, the uh, nerve goes in different directions throughout the face and uh, essentially some branches go where they don't belong and so when for instance you're trying to smile you left uh, the, the, the same side of the uh, eyes uh, the, let's say left uh, part of the face you're trying to smile your left eye closes and so the reason why is because when the facial nerve which is damaged as a result of the Bell's palsy regenerates it goes instead of just going to the to your mouse where it was it goes to the mouse and to the eye at the same time so uh, when you smile, your eye closes. So we don't want that. So what we do, we inject you know, the, the botulinum toxin around that affected eye. So when you smile, it won't close involuntarily. Uh, but um, it's very important to get an MRI if someone has a hemifacial spasm, make sure it's not, a, it's not caused by a particular lesion in the brain stem or like multiple sclerosis or small stroke potentially can cause that as well. So um, now cervical dystonia uh, is another big type of dystonia that uh, I treat. And uh, uh, it's characterized by uh, muscle contraction uh, resulting in deviation of the head in a particular direction. And there could be four, four different components. So here you see on the left lower uh, part of the slide, we see uh, called the retrocolis. So involuntary uh, extension of the neck and that's caused by hyperactivity of the splenius capitalis muscles that are located here. So I inject botulinum toxin in the back of the neck to weaken those muscles a little bit. The other type, you can have tilting of the head to the side. It's called lateral colis. And I would inject bot uh, botulinum toxin in the muscle that's responsible for uh, bringing the head to, to that uh, side. There could be torticolis, that's rotation, that's probably most common uh, variant of cervical dystonia when person's head is turned to one side. And I have to inject this muscle, it's called sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is responsible for turning of the head to the opposite side. There could be also um, head drop, so to speak. It's called anterocolis when your head is um, uh, flexed down. And so that's hard to, to treat because usually the muscles involved are right by your spine. It's hard to reach them, but I do inject these sternocleidomastoid muscles as well. Most commonly, people have combination of all three, at least out of four. So it could be tilt, turn, and twist. And so you really need to identify muscles involved, inject botulinum toxin properly with the EMG guidance. EMG, it's the uh, basically computer that's connecting to the needle and allows me to see where the needle is so I know that I'm injecting in the right uh, muscle. And so this is just the uh, showing this is sternocleidomastoid. I would inject here, I could inject here, I could inject uh, here and, and, and trapezius muscles. So all different muscles involved in the abnormal uh, positioning of the head as a result of cervical dystonia. Now, botulinum toxin is also approved for uh, upper limb spasticity. And that uh, usually is seen after stroke, uh, when person cannot open up their arm, and so we, bot botulinum toxin would be injected here or in the uh, muscle of the chest, potentially in the forearm muscle to open up the, the hand. Some dystonias would look identical to that, so focal and multifocal dystonia. So the injection would be also in the uh, biceps and this muscle and that, these muscles to open up the, uh, the, the hand for better control. 
Uh, other indications for botulinum toxin that are uh, not really dystonic, but I'll just mention since we're talking about it, drooling. So drooling, unfortunately, does occur in uh, some people with uh, Parkinson's disease. And um, what we do, we basically inject uh, uh, botox in the salivary gland that re results in a reduction in the production of, of saliva. So you have less saliva. Uh, chronic daily migraine, that's I think FDA approved, the botulinum toxin for that in indication. I don't inject that, I don't treat migraine, but it's done. And another interesting thing is this, uh, urinary bladder hyperactivity. So uh, I don't inject, but urologists inject that. At NYU, I can give you a name of those uh, doctors if you're interested. So what they do, they inject botulinum toxin in the wall of the hyperactive bladder, and that results in a relaxation of the bladder. So people who have urgency to go to the bathroom as a result of Parkinson's disease actually able to have better quality of life. So they don't need to run every, every 30 minutes or so. Uh, I cannot tell you whether this same technique can be used for enlarged prostate, and I would ask your urologist, but for the hyperactive bladder due to Parkinson's disease, certainly it does work. And same thing, it lasts three months. Um, now, we're going to switch gears and talk about ongoing clinical trials in dystonia. So, um, for some of you, it wouldn't be uh, relevant because uh, this is just for dystonia, but uh, this is part of the, today's presentation. Um, uh, so, um, this is interesting. I'll start with the botulinum toxin. Uh, there is a company called Revance, and uh, uh, they are in the process of um, developing a longer acting botulinum toxin. It's called Daxi Botulinum Toxin A, it's type A, and uh, the phase two is completed already. And it showed that uh, the effect of the botox, uh, botulinum toxin, sorry, lasts up to 24 weeks. So that is uh, six months. So I said that usual botulinum toxin lasts three months. So this one potentially can last twice as long. So now they are recruiting for phase three trials called Aspen One. Those who are interested uh, can look into that. I don't know if one of the sites is located in New York or not, but you can. Google it or go to uh, sources, I'll tell you later, and, and we'll tell you which site is recruiting. I know that trial is recruiting and it's called Aspen One. Uh, now, oral medications. So uh, oral medications also been uh, developed. I'll mention that's for, for dystonia, for different types of dystonia. So zanisamide. Um, so that study was completed, uh, and the, initially that medication is on, uh, was developed for seizures. But then they uh, thought that they could help for myclonus dystonia. It's a rare condition where people have jerking movements and posturing at the same time. Posturing, which is dystonia part, can be dealt with with botulinum toxin. For myoclonus, which is the jerking movements, uh, doctors usually use clonazepam. Uh, but uh, this medication can be very helpful, apparently. So the primary, uh, it was 23-week um, uh, study, double-blind, placebo-controlled. And the primary outcome was severity of uh, jerking movement. Secondary outcome was severity of dystonia. And the results showed significant improvement in symptoms. And the, that was completed. It's not approved for dystonia. Uh, the company, uh, it's a generic drug, so nobody really um, uh, can ask for FDA to approve it for that indication because it's already approved for epilepsy. It means any doctor can use that drug for any condition they want to. So potentially this can be added to your mixture of uh, uh, you know, drugs you're taking for dystonia because the studies recently showed significant improvement. That's called zanisamide. Now, uh, not such a happy story for levocetirizam, which is another name for this, Kepra. So also anti-seizure medication, and it was tried in um, uh, basically uh, double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study for ocular mandibular or cranial dystonia. So what it means is that people have difficulty opening their mouths, they have spasms uh, in the muscles uh, uh, of their face, and that study uh, lasted 15 weeks, and the primary outcome was the, uh, that special scale, sub-score of the dystonia scale. Uh, the study was completed and uh, showed lack of efficacy. A recent, unfortunately, a recent advanced uh, uh, publication showed that it wasn't uh, any superior to botulinum toxin. So, but I still felt that I should mention to you because you might read about it. Now, um, uh, ampicillin. Uh, amp ampicillin is the antibiotic. 
ampicillin is an antibiotics, uh, antibiotic that's used for treatment of infection, but there, there was a thought that it might improve torsinate independent, uh, independent uh, secretory function in fibroblasts. So torsin is, is basically a gene that's implicated in a pathophysiology of dystonia of DYT1. That's a genetic dystonia affecting kids mostly. And they did a pilot uh, phase one trial. It's only lasted 70 days. And uh, they looked at the safety and tolerability. Always phase one doesn't look at, at how good the medication is. They just, in terms of how, how much it works, they just look at how safe it is. So they, it was completed. Results are not available yet, but um, you know, they are uh, planning recruitment for phase two. So I would imagine the results are okay in terms of safety, but I, I don't have the data. <laughs> So uh, that's for you know, generalized dystonia. I said uh, they only looked at DYT1 generalized dystonia, but potentially it would be interesting to see other types of generalized dystonia. Would that be helpful or not? So um, uh, the other thing is uh, parampanel. So that's an AMPA antagonist. Um, uh, that's a mechanism of action. It was an open label study, phase 2B for cervical dystonia. Well, open label studies are not good because there is no placebo control. And you know that in neurological world, we can get 20% improvement in any neurological symptoms from placebo. So um, I really, hey, I'm skeptical when we're talking about open label studies that did not include um, a placebo arm. Duration was four weeks and the outcome included safety and tolerability. And so the study is recruiting. So we don't have results because it's an actively recruited study phase to be. Um, uh, so uh, for cervical dystonia, those who are interested, I can direct you to see where it's, uh, um, where it's uh, being done. Um, to my knowledge, uh, um, it's not at Cornell, uh, we don't have it at HSS, and uh, they don't have it at Sinai. I'm not sure about Columbia or NYU. Um, now, sodium oxybate. Uh, so oxybate, uh, so that's the drug I mentioned earlier, but uh, alcohol-like drug. So it's a very strictly controlled substance because it, it has potential for abuse. And uh, uh, another name for that medication is called Xyram. So it's essentially alcohol in a form of a pill that really doesn't get you drunk, but uh, relaxes you. And uh, uh, it's tried for voice tremor, for spasmodic dysphonia, when people, uh, when they're speak, speaking like that, you know, they're like kind of very crisp, uh, hoarse voice because their vocal cords are super hyperactive and they close where they're supposed to stay open. So um, it's a phase two and phase three double-blind placebo-controlled uh, crossover randomized study. And the indication was voice tremor in spasmodic dysphonia. So it's a very narrow indication. And uh, uh, so that study is being done. Uh, the, the, that was a phase two to three. The phase one and two were done, and they showed improvement. They looked at the brain activity on functional MRI. It certainly improved. This time around, they used primary outcome as the symptom improvement. So the uh, status is the recruiting. So for the phase three, if someone has voice tremor and spasmodic dysphonia, then they can certainly uh, enroll in that uh, study of Xyram. Um, now, other non-invasive approaches uh, in terms of the uh, clinical trials, they include uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. There are two trials for different indications taking place. They're both recruiting. So transcranial magnetic stimulation, so what is that? It's basically you're sitting on a chair and there is a probe and they stimulate your brain externally and uh, you frankly don't feel anything, but they're applying big magnetic force to a certain part of the brain to stimulate that area. The effect of that is short acting, meaning I'm, I'm trying to set something similar for Parkinson's disease. It's supposed to last for a month or two and then effect would dissipate. And so the idea is to do it every two months to sustain that stimulation effect. So these people, uh, basically recruiting uh, patients uh, who have uh, task-specific focal hand dystonia, the writer's cramp, and uh, they will be uh, simulating brain for three weeks, I don't know, twice a week, three times a week, and uh, look at the, uh, uh, basically, the, the uh, improvement in the hand dystonia. There are really no side effects for that trial, but, um, and I think it's interesting, those people who have um, uh, uh, involuntary spasms of the hands. Now, the other trial, also transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, the, the, it's used for spasmodic laryngeal dysphonia. So it's basically those people who uh, have difficulty speaking because of the hyperactive uh, vocal cords that they close. Uh, and um, 
instead of injecting Botox, because that's alternative it's to inject botulinum toxin in the muscles responsible for closure uh, of the uh, vocal cords, and that can result in loss of speech. If you you know inject too much in those muscles, then you won't be able to close your vocal cords. It'll be silent for three months, so that's not too much fun. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so that would be alternative for that, the stimulate area of the brain responsible for this speech, and uh, apparently it's only just one session. They see uh, how much better you get uh, just from uh, from one session, and uh, uh, the, that trial is recorded as well. I'm trying to set something up like that for um, uh, Parkinson's disease. We do have machine on premises at our neurology department, at the Hospital for Special Surgery, and uh, I'm now working on approval of that protocol. Once it's approved, I can reach out to you and and uh, uh, see if you're interested. I need ten uh, patients with Parkinson's disease uh, who would be willing to come, like few times a week for three weeks uh, for to, to see if these transcranial magnetic stimulations alleviate all their symptoms, even transiently, but see how, how long it lasts. So, but that's, uh, it's not approved yet. Now, surgical options. So, just briefly, we'll talk about GBS, I promise, and so you'll know more about it because Dr. Kaplan had only a limited amount of time to go over it, and uh, I will um, uh, cover the same topic again. So, um, DBS for dystonia, that, as I said, from the late 90s, it's been used. Uh, and uh, basically what happens is that uh, the electrode is inserted in globus pallidus, not, not the subthalamic nucleus. For subthalamic nucleus, is reserved for Parkinson's disease. I should correct that. But for globus pallidus is where the stimulation uh, takes place, and it's uh, appropriate for chronic intractable drug refractory primary dystonia, such as DYT1, that's genetic dystonia. But... It can help for, and it has helped in, uh, in generalized and segmental dystonia, hemidystonia, you know, even for people who tested negative for DYT1. So DYT1 is just one type that we know. There are a bunch of other types we haven't discovered, meaning people have it, they test negative for DYT1, so probably they have DYT32 or something like that we haven't discovered yet. So, uh, but officially it was approved initially as uh, you know, a treatment for DYT1 genetic dystonia. So... Um, now, this will conclude the, uh, the dystonia uh, part.